In San Antonio, the site of the 1998 Final Four, the fourth iteration of a special international basketball event was taking place, the Nike Hoop Summit. We know the Hoop Summit now as a bit of a tradition. It gives us a great glimpse of the talent in the pipeline headed towards the NBA. This particular year was special though. This was the moment when the world would meet Dirk Nowitzki. Basketball profi. Today I want to talk about that 1998 Hoop Summit and a chain of events that would go on to change the future of basketball. It can be tough to spot historical moments when they're happening. In basketball, many significant turning points in the history of the game have occurred when the country that invented the game, the United States, as I'm sure you're well aware, has interacted with the rest of the world. In 1992, isolation and post-dominated basketball were at their apex in terms of quality. We had a load of great seven-footers in the league like Patrick Ewing and David Robinson and Akeem Olajuwon. And the greatest individual score that ever lived was in peak form. And it just so happened that a moment where two exceptional generations of basketball overlapped, the U.S. would take its first team of professionals from the NBA to the Olympics. At that point, the U.S. probably felt like it had very little to learn. For a lot of countries, the national interest in basketball was just blossoming, and the talent of the U.S. was so overwhelming that it was hardly a competition. It was a meet and greet. But the world took interest after that. Over the years, better and better players started to spring up all over the place. Argentina, China, France. In 1997, the American game was essentially the same as it had been in 1992 physical and dominated by the one-on-one -on -one scoring of otherworldly individual talents. At this point, international basketball was not the open door to the NBA that it is now, and without ubiquitous game film of prospects, you often were hearing of guys much the same way Pete Bell heard about Neon Boudot and Blue Chips. He's totally wrong. He's never been coached. Jesus Christ. The first blip on the Dirk radar happened in 1997, when the best players in the world came to him during a stop in Berlin on the Nike Hoops Heroes Tour. These outings are brand building events for Nike, and they basically act like basketball mission trips to other parts of the world to grow interest in the game and the stars of the game, more specifically the stars in the game that are signed to Nike, which were a lot. In that game though, which was an exhibition game, Dirk made what's now considered a fairly legendary impression by allegedly, as it's told, scoring 50 on an all-star team that included the likes of Michael Jordan, Scottie Pippen, Jason Kidd, Reggie Miller, and most notably in this instance, Charles Barkley. Dirk fans are like 52. <laughs> so I was like, dude, who the hell are you? He starts talking, he's like 18, 19. I says, where you gonna play at? He says, I have to go in the army. I said, dude, you can't go in the army playing like that. I said, I tell you what. So I called Nike. I said, find out about this kid. Tell him I'll give him anything he wants to go to Auburn. <laughs> I said, just tell him, just anything he wants, we'll, we'll get it done. Dirk was 18 years old at the time. Very little footage of the game exists, but you can find some stuff floating around out there. Even though the game basically meant nothing, Dirk caught Barkley's attention, and Barkley readily admitted that it got his wheels turning about how he could get the German Hoops prodigy to Auburn, his alma mater. Get him to buy head. If he wants to come to the States, uh, I can get him into Auburn University if he wants to go. It's also funny, too, that a couple years later, Dirk had skipped the NBA, not gone to any college, and uh, had his first 30-point game against Barkley in the NBA. It's also crazy to think that today, we know about Dirk early. He's probably scouted thoroughly, he's on draft boards, YouTube is probably flooded with footage of him playing in game action, and we know all about him, probably by the time he's 14 or 15 years old. But this was 1997. There was no YouTube. The internet was just becoming a normal thing. And even after an event like the Nike Hoops Heroes game in Germany, the world still didn't fully know about Dirk. I, truthfully, I never even heard of Dirk Nowitzki, because it wasn't yeah. like he was on the college circuit. The dialogue that Barkley claims to have had about Dirk could have possibly had an impact on Dirk's decision to take part in the Nike Hoop Summit a year later. So that brings us to 1998, when Dirk did take part in the Hoop Summit. 
The outcome should have been expected though, because if Dirk could mess around and hang 50, allegedly, on a group of all-star NBA players, it should come as no surprise that this mysterious, gangly 19-year-old now from Germany could come in and set the scoring record and the rebound record for the Hoop Summit. Dirk poured in 33 points, and a lot of them came from the line because his mobility away from the basket was an enormous problem for the American high schoolers, and he grabbed 14 rebounds, all the while looking like Jake Busey from Contact. Excellent. We've got a security breach here. Right behind you, the tall guy, the technician. See him? Ring drive power is off. He's not supposed to be there. The game served as a major breakthrough for Dirk, and he himself has even admitted that before the game, he was considering playing in Europe or maybe going to college. Dirk was considering a few schools, including Kentucky and California. Well, you know, I always uh, say I would have gone to Kentucky, even though I'm, I'm not so sure if that would have happened. But, uh, it just didn't work out that way, you know, um, but it's, it's that probably is, is as close to the NBA as it gets. What people didn't know, though, was that the week of the Nike Hoop Summit game, Don and Donnie Nelson were scheming to get Dirk to the Dallas Mavericks. For this or that reason, the world team was practicing in Dallas, not in San Antonio prior to the game, and the two Nelsons took full advantage. Well, Donnie found him uh, and told me about him, and so I was fortunate enough to have him train here and then get a chance to see what Donnie told me, how great the kid was. And uh, so uh, that time together, there was just two in the gym. We were way up in the corner. Nobody knew we were there. We were hiding for because the NBA scouts were not allowed to, to scout that uh, at the YMCA. Rule breaking aside, for Dirk to have the opportunity to be Dirk in the NBA, Don Nelson might have been the perfect guy to be milling around in secrecy trying to draft him. For that reason, I think we can forgive him for breaking the rules. The Mavericks were expected to be in the middle of the lottery that year, and to make sure that they secured Dirk, they arranged a deal with the Milwaukee Bucks to select him, and history was made. The Bucks were after Robert Tractor Trailer, rest in peace. This is a really interesting moment because those two picks back to back are such a telling indicator of what the NBA had been to that point. Trailer was a bruising, plodding back to the basket forward that probably would have a hard time sticking in the league today. No two guys could have played the same position and represented two styles of play that were more opposite. Even still, Dirk was paired with a coach who would let him play the way he wanted to play, and the game was wildly impacted as a result. In the coming drafts and in the ebb and flow of trends in the NBA, teams would try to recreate what the Mavs had done. Some successes, some failures, but we see the long, soft shooting stretch four everywhere now. We even see stretch fives. But it's hard to imagine a stretch four and not think of the OG, Dirk Nowitzki. Would Dirk have ended up in the NBA in some other scenario? Possibly. I would say it's even likely. However it happened, we fans should thank the basketball gods that it did.